All right, we're really happy to have Ian Bolt from Yale who's going to tell us about UCD, Conformal Collider Physics, and uh, all that. Thank you. you want to go ahead? Perfect, yeah. So hopefully you can see my screen and everything. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing for the last couple of years now on trying to bridge certain advances in formal theory, in particular something that goes under the name of this conformal collider physics, um, with real-world um, collider data, for example, from the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and this is something we've been doing for a while, but it's gotten a lot more interesting in the last couple months because there's been a lot of measurements of these actual observables, um, all the way from a few GV jets up to multi-TV jets. And so we can actually really, um, in the data, test a lot of these things now, um, which were predicted in theory um, quite some time ago. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to go over just kind of the big uh, picture of this. I'm not going to go into too much detail on either the theory side or the experiment side. I'm just going to give kind of a broad overview. Um, but certainly, if there's more detailed questions about aspects, um, feel free to um, ask me questions. And so I apologize if some of you have seen some of the beginning of this talk. Um, but hopefully there'll be some uh, new stuff, in particular the data from the last couple of months, which has made it um, quite interesting. Okay, so just to put things in a big picture perspective, so the way that um, one typically analyzes QCD um, collisions at Hadron Colliders is in terms of these jets, which are just um, sprays of particles. And so these jets, and in particular the kinematics of these jets, are meant as infrared and, kinem or infrared and collinear safe um, proxies for the kinematics of the underlying quarks and gluons in the underlying microscopic scattering amplitudes. So in particular, by measuring their kinematic dependence, you can probe the underlying um, scattering amplitude. And so obtaining a precise description of these very complicated jet cross sections has been a huge driver of theory developments um, in quantum field theory, in particular under the amplitudes program. Um, and this has been a very kind of fruitful interplay between um, experimental measurements where people have measured extremely um, impressive cross sections. So you probably can't see exactly, but these are like W plus many, many jet cross sections, which really probe the um, nonlinear inter non interactions of um, the standard model. And so this has pushed people to be able to compute extremely um, impressive amplitudes with many legs. Um, and this really enables precision tests of the standard model and searches for new physics um, at Hadron Colliders. Um, but if one looks at these events, um, there's a lot more information in them, either just from a data analysis perspective or from a, a quantum field theory perspective, than just the underlying kind of hard scattering amplitude, which occurs kind of in the center um, here. And so in particular, instead of just looking at the kinematics of the jets themselves, one can look at the energy distribution inside a single jet. So for example, what's illustrated here is measuring this like three point um, correlation function inside of the energy distribution inside a single jet. And so this is probing a very different kind of physics, and it's really the kind of physics of how um, the energy is distributed on the um, celestial sphere or the sphere at infinity. And so this is interesting um, from a QCD perspective because it really probes the kind of um, parton shower and ultimately the, the hadronization process into the hadrons which come into your detector. Um, and so the original motivation for looking at this type of observable was actually extremely kind of practically minded and goes into the name of jet substructure. And so the goal of this was that if I'm an experimentalist and I want to be able to detect, for example, that there's some um, Higgs boson or new particle that's produced, if this decays hadronically, um, as in this picture, then the only way that I can detect that something interesting happened is by measuring in detail the structure of the correlation functions in the energy flux which are coming out into the detector. And so by if you're able to understand this, it really provides qualitatively new ways to study physics um, at the LHC. And so just for these kind of practical um, purposes, this um, kind of program really um, reinvigorated the study of jets in their own right in um, QCD. And so got people kind of thinking about jets just for their own sake. Um, and so in particular, if you're interested in um, QCD in particular, um, there's a lot of interesting physics hidden in the more detailed substructure of the jet. So in particular, one knows that in QCD, one has, for example, confinement, or if you um, do heavy ion collisions, you can produce um, the quark-gluon plasma. 
And in some sense, the details of the either the confinement transition or properties of the quark gluon plasma are all imprinted in some way in this energy flux that you see at infinity. And so these are much more subtle questions than if there is a Higgs or not. Um, and it's really motivated people to think about how to interpret asymptotic energy flux in um, collider experiments and how you can map that back to the underlying property or the properties of the underlying um, field theory. And so just as one more kind of big picture motivation, one should really think about this just kind of like in cosmology. So there one infers the kind of early time or microscopic physics from the asymptotic or late time um, energy flux. And so what we really want to do on the theory side is to try and develop kind of field theory techniques to really be able to interpret, for example, subtle correlations in these um, heavy iron collisions in terms of specific quantities in the underlying field theory so that we can really go from measurements which can be made in an experiment to um, properties that we understand and know how to talk about in the underlying um, field theory. Um, so with that as motivation, the kind of outline of my talk, First, I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of some of the recent uh, advances on the more formal thought side about how to talk about asymptotic fluxes of charges, and I'll primarily focus on um, energy. Um, then I'll focus on the particular case of asymptotically free QCD, where you have no particular um, scales in the problem. And I'll show that one can identify very nice um, universal scaling behaviors. Um, associated with the underlying um, nearly conformal um, interactions of quarks and gluons. And so this will allow us to identify particular scaling exponents that we can really then go out and actually measure um, in very high energy um, jet data. And then depending on the time, I'll go through a couple examples of what happens when one adds in an additional scale. So both either confinement, um, the top quark, or in the quark gluon plasma, all of which introduce um, additional scales in the problem, which will break these nice um, scaling behavior. And the way in which they break them allows us to identify um, physics of the underlying um, problem. But we'll see how that goes for time. Okay, so first, um, decoding the energy flux. Um, so if one does, for example, condensed matter physics or cosmology, the way that we always talk about um, kind of characterizing some system, particularly in the condensed matter set setting, is using correlation functions of local operators. So you put down some local operators and do some kind of, for example, um, linear response theory, and we understand very well how to characterize the system. And in particular, the reason why correlation functions are nice is that they give you some ruler which sets some overall length or characteristic um, scale of your problem. And so you know in particular that if you measure some dynamics when you've set the correlation length at some um, particular um, length scale, that you're accessing the dynamics that occurs at that particular scale. And so what we would like to do is to kind of achieve a similarly coherent picture of collider physics, where we can really just pick out from the asymptotic energy flux, the kind of dynamics which is happening at um, different scales. And so in particular, what we want to do to kind of um, is to abstract this to a toy problem. So of course, Many people calculate things um, in collider physics, and there's many um, event shape observables which have been studied over the years. But what we'd like to do is to kind of strip this back to its ab absolute simplest um, underlying setup so that we can really study this, for example, in a toy um, quantum field theory. And so to do that, one of the things that one needs to understand is from the theoretical perspective, what actually is the kind of operator definition of some um, detector such as um, CMS, for example, shown here. And so when we have some collider physics experiment, the kind of toy setup that we have is we like excite the vacuum. And so we do this with, for example, um, a hammer by hitting the system. And we know how to expand this hammer over a set of local operators which create the excitation. Um, and then the second step in this is that we want to detect the flux which comes out into our um, detector. And so much like how we expand the hammer over a set of local operators, what we want to be able to do is to expand a generic camera or a generic detector over a set of what are referred to as detector operators um, B, which are shown here. And so generically, what we'd like to understand is kind of what is the space of these detectors and how to understand these operators um, in quantum field theory. And so if we can understand these operators, 
then we can kind of um, abstract what we're doing in these experiments and kind of study this or a toy version of collider physics um, in a very nice and controlled um, setup. And so this is where there's been a lot of um, progress in the last little while is in understanding these detector operators. And so here I'll focus on a very simple case, which are just um, calorimeter cells, i.e. detectors that measure um, energy flux. And so these are something that were kind of floating around in the literature for a long time, but they were kind of made popular in particular by um, Hoffman and Maldacena, who kind of reinvigorated their study and emphasized them as interesting observables just in generic um, field theories, not just um, in kind of applications of QCD. And the way that one should think about this detector operator, so you can either think of it as, or you should, as a kind of local um, cell in your calorimeter, or as an uh, integral operator in a Penrose diagram. And so what this object is doing is it takes the stress tensor of your theory, since in this case you're measuring um, the energy flux. You dot it into some particular direction, which characterizes the, um, the direction of the, of the calorimeter cell on the celestial sphere. You then integrate over all times because you're imagining this flux just coming off to infinity. So you just have your calorimeter cell, which is sitting there as the energy flux um, goes off to infinity. And then you move this object off to infinity um, since in the real world, the kind of scale of the detectors is much further than the scale of any of the underlying dynamics of the quantum field theory. And so you can, for example, just study a free theory. And if you use this definition, and write it in terms of creation and annihilation operators, you'll find that it just detects the energy flux of the particles in that particular um, direction. Uh, but the very nice thing about this is that this now applies um, more generically. And so you can write down a kind of toy version or a quantum field theory version of what you're doing when you're studying um, jet substructure is that you're really just studying correlation functions of several of these operators in some state that you produce. So the LHC, you happen to produce this state um, by colliding protons, but more generally, you can just do this with some local operator um, in your field theory. And so from this perspective of kind of quantum field theory, this is now successfully abstracted. What you're really doing when you're studying correlate or when you're studying jet substructure, namely you're just studying um, these correlation functions. Um, these are kind of a nice object just to kind of put them into a context because they may be a little bit um, less familiar that are kind of in an intermediate position between amplitudes and correlation functions. And so this will be very nice later on because when you go to compute these in perturbation theory, we'll be able to use um, techniques from both worlds. So in particular, we'll be able to use a lot of the um, symmetry um, structures and operator product expansion um, for the study of correlation functions. And in perturbation theory, we'll be able to use a lot of the integral techniques um, from scattering amplitudes. Um, and these objects are kind of an intermediate position because essentially they're correlation functions with the correlation um, object at um, asymptotic infinity. And so this enables them to be completely IR finite observables um, that you can actually measure without having like a jet resolution or something um, to make them infrared and collinear safe. Um, but, they have, but they also contain asymptotic states, just like an amplitude, which is what you want um, in a collider um, experiment. And so despite their kind of physical importance, these are um, much less explored than either their correlation function or um, amplitude counterparts. Although there's been a lot of um, interest in the last um, couple of years, so this is starting to kind of bridge the gap. Um, so this is kind of um, a nice um, toy setup. So you can abstract um, this question to these very nice um, operators that you can study um, in your favorite theory. Um, but one thing which one obviously, or I come from a kind of collider physics background, and so that one would like yeah. to understand. Yeah. 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 Question. Yeah, just a question. So, so far it's completely generic, no perturbation theory. You just define the object. And yeah, exactly, don't... exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and so one can... thing I should say so, in a conformal theory, you can really just take this object directly because you can do a conformal transformation to directly put it at null infinity. But in a massive theory, you really have to take this limit. And so this object is kind of completely gener gener general at this stage. So obviously later on, when I compute them and give expressions for them, I'll do that in um, perturbation theory. But for now, this is just an, uh, a definition of an object that you can compute. Um, and you could do it, for example, at strong coupling um, or weak coupling or whatever you want. Um, 
Yeah, I also have a question. So the, the reason you do three point correlation function is does it have something to do with three colors or is it better than two point? Uh, so I'll, I'll come to that later. So, so far, this is just a picture of a, a representative object, um, which is, so I'll come later to what the correlation functions actually represent. And so I'll first do, when we'll kind of build them up in complexity. So I'll start with the two point and then I'll show calculations of the three and four points. So in some sense, they just get more and more complicated. And this one is so far just for illustrative purposes, but I'll highlight, for example, why the three point is, is useful, for example, in the quark gluon plasma. But at this stage, it's just a little picture. Um, it's just kind of a cartoon. Um, so if you now set the resolution, I know that you haven't defined any like formal quantity, but if you send it to zero, should you land, uh, should you find divergences and basically land on the amplitude or not? No, 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 no. So this object is but with, with infinite resolution, this object is IR infrared and collinear state. Um, yeah. yeah. And in particular, that's why it has a linear energy weighting to make it infrared and collinear safe. So if you did, instead of like an energy flux, you could just do like a number flux. Um, and then this would be IR unsafe. And that's kind of counting like the actual number of, that's just has the infrared catastrophe. And so it's important that it has this linear energy weighting. And so it's really the, the flux of the conserved quantity, which makes it um, well behaved. Mm -hmm. um, um, any more questions or? Um, okay. Um, yeah. And so this is kind of a nice theory idealization. We can compute these in whatever um, theory we want and understand their properties. Um, but what we want to kind of understand is can this possibly work, for example, in real world collisions that are extremely complicated, um, such as at the LHC or in heavy ion collisions? Um, and then more importantly, can it provide kind of new ways of understanding, um, for example, QCD in these very complex um, collisions? And so my hope of the rest of the talk is to convince you that it actually can. And so this is just kind of one plot. So this goes to the question. So this is of the two point um, correlation function. And so I'll, I just kind of want to show what it can do um, here. And then we'll go through in the rest of the talk kind of aspect, theoretical aspects of it. Um, so this is a plot of the two-point correlation function as a function of the angle. So since this is a hadron collider, it's denoted RL, but you can just think about this as theta, the angle on the sphere between the two uh, particles. And so as you go like this, you go to smaller and smaller angles. And what you can see is you have this regime um, shown here, where you can clearly see a particular power law of scaling. And in particular, as I'll show later, this has some non-integer um, scaling associated with certain anomalous dimensions of the underlying um, quarks and gluons. And so this we can really compute in perturbation theory. And this has non-trivial higher point correlations. So you can compute, for example, three point correlation functions. And these will have a non-trivial structure coming from the interacting um, quarks and gluons. Then at some scale, which just co corresponds to the confinement scale, you have this complete reorganization of the degrees of freedom. So you can just see, um, for example, that you can see that there is confinement uh, by I. And then on the left side of this plot over here, what you have is a scaling associated with um, just the presence of non-interacting hadrons. So this is actually just an integer scaling. So there's no um, interactions. So there's no anomalous dimensions. And it has all trivial higher point correlations. So like three point, four point, et cetera. Um, Correlation functions are all um, completely flat. And so that what this allows you to do is to really see just from the kind of flux of energy into your detectors, the whole kind of um, transition from quarks and gluons and the nature of their interaction into uh, hadrons and to really see the confinement um, transition. And so what we'll do in the rest of the talk is to understand primarily this perturbative regime where one can actually do calculations and kind of what gives rise to the scaling and then the structure of the higher point um, correlations. Um, okay. So the simplest aspect of this um, plot in particular that we can understand is the um, scaling behavior in the very high energy regime where we have um, asymptotically free quarks and gluons, um, no mass scales, and we can do um, perturbation theory very accurately. Um, and so the kind of motivation for what one should be looking for 
um, in these or in quantum physics experiments, um, or one motivation is very nice scaling behavior, which one um, sees in the Euclidean regime. So for example, as you bring two local operators together, what you typically get, or you have an operator product expansion, and so you can um, exhibit very nice scaling behavior with anomalous dimensions of the underlying operators. And so this is very nice if you think about it kind of from a collider physics experiment, namely that you can do kind of measurements on macroscopic systems and from the scaling laws that you exhibit or that you see by measuring these macroscopic systems, you can extract out the anomalous dimensions of the underlying kind of mac microscopic theory. And so it really provides this very nice map between um, measurements on very complicated and macroscopic systems and the underlying um, parameters of the microscopic um, Lagrangian. And so the thing which is very nice and was originally um, posited by Hoffman and Malvasina and then developed by a number of um, other people is that these energy flow or these kind of um, detector operators also admit an operator product expansion, which is called the light ray operator product expansion. And so the reason why this is non-trivial is that these are now these um, null integrated operators. Um, and so what it's saying is that as you bring two of these null operators together, you have an operator product expansion onto another null operator. Um, and so you can think of this as you can kind of expand some set of cameras over a more general set of detectors, which can absorb or detect kind of more general features of what's coming in your detector. And so you don't need to be able to physically have these detectors, but what this operator product expansion predicts is that, for example, as you bring two of these energy flux detectors together, it predicts a universal um, scaling behavior as a function of the angle between these two detectors with some anomalous dimensions. So this in particular is the twist um, shown here, but it predicts universal behavior with certain anomalous dimensions. Um, and so in particular, um, what it says, if you believe this operator product expansion, um, is that it predicts universal scaling behavior in the correlations of energy flux if you're at very high energies where you have no, um, in, in the case of QCD, where you have no other mass scales um, in your problem. And so effects from the running coupling or logarithmic deviations of this can be um, incorporated in perturbation theory um, straightforwardly. Um, as I'll, as I'll show. Um, and but so this here, is kind of- Ian, yeah. here, okay. short, short distances correspond to small angles here, which is sort of the opposite of what you just showed us. Good. So, sorry. So, so in this case, so th this is a, it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a confusing. So very short or small angles correspond to long distances from the field theory perspective. Um, so that's why it's a non-trivial um, statement about the structure of the OPE. Um, so it's not like a normal UV OPE. Um, um, so there's there's like a UV IR um, flipping which is happening. So very small angles correspond to very long distances. And so that's why it'll be important that in QCD, so when you apply this operator product expansion, so for example, in this um, plot shown here, there'll be kind of a, a sweet spot region. Um, for example, like from here to here, where the leading term coming from the OPE determines the scaling, but you're not too small to be um, in the non-perturbative regime. Um, but is, there some, is there some intuitive understanding of why large angles are small distances? Yes, so the, the kind of way that one can understand this leading um, scaling is just to consider, like if you just consider one particle that's produced and splits and comes into your detector out here. So if you just have some angle here, the, the leading or the, the behavior without the anomalous dimension is just coming from the structure of this pole. So it just comes from this one over like S12, which is like one over like theta squared times these energies. And these energies are integrated over. And so you get this pole um, shown here. So as you bring these apart, you're kind of um, driving the lifetime of the intermediate particle back um, or making it zero and very short lived. Whereas 
as the two particles or as the detectors become very close, you have a particle that lives for a very, very long time and then just splits right into the detector. So it's almost like the into like for like ADS CFT where you have this UVIR. Um, it's almost kind of like that, uh, but it's really just driven by the structure of the propagators. Um, Thanks. Question: Are you, are you going to discuss what the leading operator is in QCD and yes, yes, particular operator? You're going to talk about that later, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I will come to that in a second. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I'll, I will come to that in one. So this is extremely, um, general and in some sense contentless. And the thing that makes it, um, useful is that when actually, or where the advances are is understanding the objects which appear on the right-hand side of this equation. And in particular for phenomenological purposes, as I just asked, you only need the leading operator and that's what makes it, um, practical. Um, and so this is actually a prediction that was made um, about 15 years ago, um, and there's this recorded talk um, by Malasina where he discussed this, um, and Polchinski kind of asked, there's a huge amount of data, um, why haven't people um, done this? Um, and then there was this kind of answer um, that no one has done this, um, and so shockingly this was then, um, because people got interested in kind of other things as the LHC started up, this was just kind of um, left behind. And so I should say that this is not quite historically accurate. This was something that was also floated in the kind of 1970s, but at that time you didn't have the ability to compute these higher order um, objects um, nicely in perturbation theory, and the detectors were so bad that you could not measure these things in a, a nice um, a regime where you could really see this nice um, scaling behavior. And so the nice thing is that now one can actually just go to the LHC and understand them. And so what we want to do as it was um, related to your question, is to just understand what the leading objects which appear um, in this OPE are. And so in particular, as I said, this is a, an expansion in the, the twist of the operators. And so in weak coupling, the leading operators have twist approximately two. And so if you just want to describe the leading scaling behavior at the LHC, you can just drop all the higher order terms in this um, expansion. And all you need to understand are the twist two um, light ray operators in QCD. So it's an interesting, in a, in a CFT, you can really prove that this um, converges and it's interesting to study um, the higher order corrections to this. And a lot of people have been um, working on the general structure of these light ray operators. But the very nice thing for the LHC, for all in practical purposes, is you just need to understand these leading um, operators. And so this is actually very easy to do because these operators can be constructed just like this energy flux operator. They can also be constructed as integrals of local operators. Um, and so in particular, um, one knows, so if you look in like Peskin, the twist two operators or local operators in QCD are characterized by some spin J, um, which you can think of as a kind of um, energy weighting. And then a transverse spin which is really associated with uh, like spin along the um, axis that the object is moving, which can be um, zero or two in weak coupling. Um, and these, so if one looks at these operators, you essentially have one for every value of J, you have one of these local operators for quarks, which is shown here, and you have one of these um, for gluons, um, which is shown here. And so there's also a transverse spin two operator for gluons, which for now I'll just kind of ignore. Um, and there's, there's interesting things one can do with it, but for now I'll just focus on these um, simplest transverse spin zero um, objects, which are relevant um, um, in the simplest case of the LHC. So you can think of loosely speaking, what these objects are doing is you can take them. So this one has a, just a quark and this one has a gluon, much like for the stress tensor, you take the operators off to infinity and you null or you integrate them along all time. Um, and what that produces is for each value of J, um, a detector um, operator for quarks and a detector operator um, for gluons. And so if you work out in perturbation theory, what these are doing, these are really, you can think of them loosely speaking as detecting quark or gluon states. But in some more generic com um, con combination than appears in um, the stress tensor. And so the nice thing about this is that the anomalous dimensions of these operators so 
are which are just defined uh, by this equation shown here, then determine the leading behavior of jet substructure observables. So if you have, for example, some complicated um, uh, combination of these energy operators, if you OP these down to some particular um, operator like this, then you know it's scaling uh, behavior. And so this allows you to predict the scaling behavior of generic endpoint functions as a function of their overall um, scale, uh, which is very um, convenient in particular because these anomalous dimensions can be computed to very high um, orders. Um, okay, so what we can do is then we can just, I'll skip uh, that one. We can do this, we can just go out and measure these um, at the LHC. And so this is a plot. Now this is just the zoomed in version of the plot I showed earlier, showing the scaling behavior of this two point function as a function of the angle between the two detectors. And this is, um, I'll get to real um, data in a second. So this is analysis done using some CMS open data, which is released to the public. And so you can see in the dotted, um, the dots are um, actual data points. Um, and then these are calculations at different um, orders for the anomalous dimensions. Um, and so you can see this very nice um, scaling behavior in the energy flux, which has good agreement um, between the perturbative calculations um, and the data. And the thing that's very nice about this is this is really in the full and very complicated LHC environment without doing any um, kind of anything to the data. And so because you're isolating this kind of universal feature, you can really um, compute it very nicely um, in perturbation theory. Question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, is this a completely parameter-free calculation or are there are some OPE coefficients or something else that need to be fit to the data? Good, so here, this is a completely parameter-free. In a second, what I'll show you is that you can use it to fit for the value of the strong coupling as a parameter. Um, so here, one is really computed the um, the full, so this is like a expectation value of two of these correlators um, in some state. So one has really computed the state in perturbation theory. So one has done the full um, calculation of this. And then one has um, computed the leading op or the OPE coefficients for the, the this leading term in the expansion, as well as the anomalous dimensions. And so this is really um, parameter free. Um, but one can yeah. see, so... Right. I'm asking because, you know, one of the reasons I'm asking is because, you know, the, 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 the central line goes right through the data much better than the errors do, which yes. makes it look like a fit, right? It makes it look like... I agree. So, good. So, one, so this plot actually, well, as we'll come to in a second, does not tell you very much because in this plot is just dominated by the classical one over theta squared, um, um, scaling. So this one you cannot really see by eye the anomalous dimensions. And so these errors are coming just from the like certain like scale variations which should not really be taken um, seriously. So what I'll show in a second is how we can take um, ratios of, of kind of different endpoint functions to isolate the actual anomalous um, scaling. And these will be more um, will actually have interesting information in them. Um, but as of, as of now, this is more just kind of illustrating that it can be done. And this is largely dominated by the classical scaling. Um, okay. um, but you'll see in a second, so you can actually compute the anomalous dimensions of these and really measure the, the spectrum of the anomalous dimensions. And then these can be used to fit, for example, um, for the um, anomalous dimensions or equivalently the strong coupling constant. Um, um, but hopefully that'll become clear in a second, yeah. Um, and so this, in the last couple of months, this object has now been measured by a huge variety um, of experiments. And so they've measured it, the thing which is very neat. So this, this plot, one should not really be able to read very much from it. We'll come into more detail. This is just to show that it has um, been measured. And so it's been measured in particular all the way from um, 15 GeV. So this is very low, all the way up to, um, to about 2000 GV or 2 TeV. Um, and in all these cases, you see this very nice um, scaling behavior um, here. And so, as I said, this is primarily dominated by this classical scaling. And so can we actually accurately measure the anomalous scaling, which is the kind of interesting part um, for these observables? Um, 
And so this is where this light ray operator product expansion way of doing things actually becomes very powerful. And so in particular, if I consider some generic endpoint correlation function, or in particular, if I consider a J minus one point correlation function, the leading term in the OPE are the twist to spin J operators. Um, and so in particular for the two point correlator, it's the twist to spin three operators. And so what this says is that if I have some configuration of like N points, as I scale them as a function of the overall size, that scaling is dictated by different anomalous dimensions. And so in particular, if I take this um, ratio like this, this will go like um, some difference of the anomalous dimensions. So this will go like gamma J minus gamma three. And so this cancels out um, the classical piece. And so this would be um, flat if there were no um, anomalous dimensions. And so it explicitly probes the structure of the anomalous dimension. So this is where you actually get inf interesting information about the underlying structure of the correlators. And so again, this is um, for the open data, and then I'll show the full um, result in a second. So these are results for these ratios for the three point over two point, four point over two point, et cetera, all the way up to six point over two point. Um, and you can see that in each of these cases, you really observe um, this nice um, scaling behavior. And in particular, you can see that you have larger anomalous dimensions for higher point um, correlation functions, which is just the monotonicity of these anomalous dimensions um, in spin. Um, and so here you can see that there is bigger deviations between the um, results and the, or the data and the calculation of this is because you're really probing the actual um, corrections here. Um, and so the nice thing about this is you're really kind of probing the spectrum of the twist two light ray operators, which kind of form the structure of the energy flux. Um, you're kind of able to extract those just by measuring these correlation functions, which is very nice. Um, and so this was done um, to extremely high, or a very high precision measurement, um, in particular by CMS, which measured this particular ratio of this three point correlation function to the two point correlation function. Um, over a huge range of energies, and in particular, all the way up to 2 TeV, um, where you have extremely good, um, or you're like very, very deep in the perturbative region. And so what you so can question, see is these... So, yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. so these gammas are computable in QCD perturbation theory? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So these are really the anomalous dimensions of the twist to spin J operators, so they're known to like four loops or something. Um, they're known They're known extremely well. And so the thing that's harder to do is to compute like the OPE coefficients or the state. So these anomalous dimensions are, are known very, very well um, um, as an expansion of the coupling, yeah. Um, um, and you can see, so this is now a, a higher order calculation using a particular input value of the um, strong coupling constant. And so later we'll, we'll fix or will extract the strong coupling um, constant from this, but you can see this very nice um, scaling behavior where you get a nice agreement between the calculation um, and, the and the experiment. And the other thing which is kind of neat is you can see that this, the slope of these lines gets steeper as you go to lower energy, which is just the fact that these anomalous dimensions depend on the strong coupling. And so they get larger and larger as you go to lower um, energies which is just asymptotic freedom. And so it's a bit different than what you get in a conformal theory um, where you um, would have the exact same scaling behavior for all values of the energy. Here you can kind of nicely see this change in the, in the slope. Um, um, and as I said, this is just a plot of the, of the slope as a function of the energy. And so you can very nicely see um, this asymptotic freedom um, by eye. Um, and so, of course, you already knew um, that there was asymptotic freedom. And so one thing that this allows one to actually do um, at a quantitative level is to extract the value of the strong coupling from the measurement of these scaling exponents. Um, and so this was something that was done um, by CMS. And so this is very nice because it really allows you to use the kind of modern um, detectors and uh, very high energies. And so this had previously been difficult just because of the um, complexity of the LHC environment. But this was actually able to extract the value of alpha s. Um, so this is the particular value at a 4% um, accuracy. Um, 
And so this is not the best. So if you look on this plot on the list, it's a kind of collection of different uh, measurements with their uncertainties shown in um, yellow. And so you can see that the kind of uncertainty for kind of world record uh, precision is about kind of one or two percent on this. And so this um, band and this central value here are what was extracted from the LHC um, um, from this LHC experiment. And so I should say that this is kind of a very first um, and just a preliminary demonstration that this kind of works. Um, and it can be done both experimentally um, and on the theory side uh, much better, but it's just kind of showing that you're in the ballpark um, of these very uh, precise fits and you can kind of use this technique to actually um, get out some something quantitative from the very complicated um, LHC environment. Yeah. So the the data from QCD you put in with the, these anomalous dimensions, these are n n is free or is it some large n c data? Uh, or is the large n c here even does it play any role or you are fitting LHC so you cannot uh, Yeah, so this is you mean like n c being number of color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is done in the this calculation is really done for like the physical, so it's really done for like NC equals three, keeping that fixed. And it's done for like the, the beta function is computed as a function. So this is computed as a series in alpha S. And then the only thing that's floated is the actual value of alpha S at the scale MZ. So you compute everything else as complete perturbative expansions in alpha S and the number of colors. And those are all fixed with the only input being alpha S of MZ. Um, That makes sense. Yeah. So it, it is actually the large NC here. Is there anything that you can use it? Because I guess that this input you said this perturbative input you, is better known for large NC for the kind of just the planar part of the. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so like later we'll do like in n equals four. I'll show like a calculation of like the shape dependence of the four point, and so there one can use um large NC. Um. So here it doesn't. The anomalous dimensions are better known at large NC, but the the, the thing that's actually um, preventing the perturbative accuracy is the calculation of the perturbative state. So you need to like, um, you actually, so this is something that was done by like Mitov and um, collaborators. Uh, you need the like inclusive cross section to produce like a single gluon at the LHC. Um, and so this is where, so this is like, um, uh, like two to three jets at NNLO. And so this is really the, the blockade is in the kind of um, the production cross section for um, like, which is, which ultimately goes into the OPE coefficients. Um, the anomalous dimensions are, are very well known. And so um, although I focus more on them, the actual blockade is on the kind of initial state um, at this stage. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and so now is related to the earlier question. So here, I or so far, I've talked just about um, the kind of scaling behavior, which is just things as a function of size. And so, of course, the other thing which one can try and do is compute the actual um, shape dependence um, of higher point um, correlation functions. Um, and so these higher point correlation functions are, of course, interesting because they probe some actual structure of the interactions. And so what one would like to do is to, for example, compute the three point um, correlation functions of energy flux. And so unlike these, for example, the two point is just a single scale. And so it's um, completely fixed. Whereas the three point and higher are some function of the non-trivial um, shape. And so um, perhaps surprisingly, the only explicit results for correlators with N um, bigger than two were these strong coupling results in the original paper of Hoffman and Malacena. And so this was computed um, in, or as a planar n equals four um, using ADS-CFT as an expansion about the large coupling. So this is a expansion one over the coupling. And so you can see that here, all these correlation functions are uniform plus small fluctuations. Um, and so this is the exact opposite of what you'd kind of expect or, um, or weak coupling where you really have these like individual um, quarks and gluons. Um, but the nice thing about this is that one can repurpose um, techniques for doing integrals for perturbative scattering amplitudes 
So just um, try computing some of these objects in um, perturbation theory. And so I'll, so far, what has been computed is the three and four point um, correlation functions. Um, and so I'm not going to go through the details, but I just want to highlight kind of why these have a very simple structure. Um, and so um, if so, I'll just kind of sketch how one actually does this integral to show that it's, it's a very nice um, object. And then um, this can be there are then ways of doing these integrals, um, which are very well understood and allows one to make um, progress. Um, and so the way that one should think about this is that if you want to compute, for example, this three-point correlation function shown here, at lowest order, what you have is an object which describes the splitting of one particle into three, which then go into your detector. And then you have to do these integrals over the time or equivalently over the energy weighting. Um, and so this um, splitting is just some function of the Mandelstam invariance. And then you essentially have to integrate over the energies which go through each of them with some momentum conserving um, delta function. And so if you take this as a toy integral where this um, one to three splitting function is just some Mandelstam invariant, so more generically, it's just some rational function of the, of the Mandelstams and the energy fractions. But if you just take this kind of toy integral, what you get is an integral where you have to integrate over these energy parameters times this function um, shown here, where these zijs are the differences in some stereographic um, coordinates between the, the, the points on the, on the sphere. And so these are frozen by the shape of the detector. And then you have to do um, this particular integral. Um, but if you look at this integral, this exactly takes the form of some Feynman parameter integral. And so more generically, this defines a very nice class of um, finite integrals. And these are very, or these are very well studied, um, and there are good ways of doing these. And so, in in general, these are just some nice class of finite integrals. In this specific case, you can actually just map this explicitly to a, a loop integral. So this um, case is easily recognized as this um, three mass um, triangle um, shown here. So you can just explicitly do the mapping. More generically, they're just some um, nice integrals. And so the structure of such integrals is quite well understood. In particular, this one is kind of trivial from the modern um, loop integral uh, perspective. And so this allows us to start building up some perturbative data for the structure of these objects. And so for example, if one computes at just like lowest order in the weak coupling expansion, um, the result for this three point correlation function in n equals four. So this is shown here as a function of some um, cross ratios. Um, you'll see that it has this very nice um, structure in terms of what one expects um, from amplitude's calculations, in particular in terms of certain um, single-valued harmonic polylogs. Um, but the very nice thing about this is that this is really at the level of the physical observable, i.e. at the level of the kind of correlation functions that you can actually measure in your detector. So you don't have to like square the amplitude or have any um, um, infrared or collinear safe kind of jet algorithm. This is really just the structure of the physical observable which now has this nice kinematic dependence essentially on the shape of this um, triangle. And so you get a very similar class of integrals as you do um, in the amplitudes case. Um, and so more recently um, with, um, this was really using the expertise of um, Kai Yan for the integrals um, and Emery Sokachev and Ima Chitrin to get a very nice result from this um, in n equals four. So we were able to compute actually the, the four point um, um, object in planar um, n equals four, and you can get a relatively compact expression in terms of weight three um, poly logarithms. So in general, as you add each detector, you just go up um, in weight. And so I think the thing that's kind of interesting about this is that these are by construction finite integrals because these are infrared and collinear safe um, observables, and they provide kind of a playground for the exploration of perturbative structure of objects, um, in particular of physical observables. Um, and so they're that's remain and have kind of a nice um, perturbative structure, just like um, for scattering amplitudes. Um, and so the fun thing, so we can compute these um, exactly in terms of analytic expressions. And then you can actually just go out and measure the shape of these um, higher point correlation functions in data. So this is a plot of the non-Gaussianity, which is just some ratio of the three point um, correlation functions to the two point um, correlation functions. Um, and so this is a function of the shape of the triangle. So it's a little bit hard to understand, but 
back here is a kind of equilateral triangle. Here, this this phi that parameterizes is kind of the angle of this triangle. And then this C is loosely speaking some ratio of the lengths, but over here is some kind of flattened triangle, and then down here are these kind of squeezed triangles. And so you can directly compare what you get in perturbation theory for the shape of this higher point correlation function um, with um, what you can actually measure. And so this is fun for us because it really illustrates that we have theoretical control over these multi-point um, correlation functions. Um, and then so just to... Question, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So for, for, for QCD, do you also have an analytic calculation and it's more complicated? Yeah, so in, Q, in so QCD... the result right equals four, but you can do it yeah. in QCD? Yes, good. So okay. in QCD, the result is in terms of the same logarithmic functions, you just get really disgusting um, rational prefactors. So at a, like at a technical level, it's no more complicated. You just you just get a lot of extra um, extra stuff. Um, but you can still it's just like instead of this, it's like a page. It's, it's just not as as compact. But it's just yeah. rational functions that appear. Um, so uh, uh, for this special case of planar n equals four, we know that yeah. there is this duality for amplitudes. There is a duality with Wilson loops, and there are certain integrability techniques one can use. Now, for this object, for these energy energy correlators, is any of that available, or can you transport some results, let's say, from integrability here? Yeah. So I do not know how to do that, it would, yeah, that would be very nice. Um, and it's not understood. So I think it depends particularly on the, how many points. So at four points, you can really get it from the four point function of stress tensors. And so this is something which is, is very well known. Um, but once you go beyond that, you, you have to really do it from the, um, amplitudes like squared amplitude side and I I yeah I would like to know better how to do that but I think yeah um, so this way um, the way that this was obtained so they they got a very nice um, Emery Sokotev and Dima Chicharin got a, a very nice expression for this object by squaring um, a form factor in n equals four which they computed using these like MHV expansion rules um, and so what one really needs to be able to compute is form factors um, at high orders and then to integrate them. Um, but the, I, th I think part of the problem is you need, you, to use integrability is very hard because you don't have a fixed number of particles. So these are just at lowest order in the coupling. But then if you want to do it at higher orders, so for example, if you wanted to compute this four point correlation function at higher orders, in perturbation theory, you have like situations where you have an extra particle where you integrate it over the whole phase space and it doesn't go into your detector. And so this is the part that is very hard to understand how one could do this um, using integrability. Um, unless you go back, sorry? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, one more question about this weight-free function because if you again compare it to what you would get in amplitudes, at one loop you get weight two, at two loop you get weight four. So this is somehow in between. Exactly. Or, yeah. What is the yes. kind of intuitive picture? Why is it like one and a half loop in some sense? So that I, why is one and a half loop? I don't fully understand, but the structure that you really get is just for each detector, um, you have an integral over the energy fraction. Um, and then of some rational um, uh, function of, so you really just get some like quadrics or products of quadrics in the denominator. And then you integrate, you just have um, for like N minus one um, integrals. And so really speaking, like you really just get kind of like N minus one um, non-trivial integrals when you have N detectors. And so you just keep getting a, a weight increase. Um, And so there, there is something that, yeah, as you say, they're a little bit in between, and this is why it's very hard to um, use some of these um, techniques. And so the nicest thing one could use is to um, get these compact expressions for the form factors, which can then be integrated using um, nice techniques developed by Kai for like IBP on um, finite integrals. Um, but I think this is something where I think um, like a lot of the 
techniques can be adapted, but they need a little bit of adaptation. Um, um, okay. And then since I think I just have a few minutes left, I'll just um, show one illustration of where one can use this understanding of this three-point correlation function in some more um, complicated system. So I'll skip through, sorry, a bunch of stuff. Um, and so one place where these are very interesting is to try and use them um, to understand the quark gluon plasma. Um, and so here, what you'd like to do is in a very toy example, is to shoot some um, quark or gluon through the quark gluon plasma. And you would like to understand how this, the presence of this quark gluon plasma modifies um, the substructure of the jet or modifies um, these um, correlations that are imprinted into the jet. Um, and so the simplest thing one could do is to just detect that there is such a ball of very small um, plasma um, in the begin or in the center of your detector. And this is where this question um, uh, about the intuition for short versus long time scales um, that was asked earlier kind of comes into play. And so the very nice thing is because you have this angular separation, if you're at very small angles, the kind of physical pictures you have some quark or gluon that live for a very long time and then um, splits when it's near the detector. And then as you open um, the angle, you kind of drive this back into the plasma. And at some point you see a very um, abrupt um, transition. And so this is, so there'll be data released on this soon. So right now this is just um, stimulation, but you can see that that's exactly what happens where you have some very nice vacuum like power law scaling at um, very small angles. And then you see this abrupt transition here exactly as you enter um, the scale of the plasma. So you can really kind of resolve its structure. Um, and then what you want to do is you want to measure the shape, for example, of three point correlation functions in this region to observe, for example, the wake of the plasma as this object is plowing um, through it. So I'll just um, skip to this. And so this is now, again, showing this three-point correlation function. So this is in um, the vacuum, and this is in the presence of the um, quark gluon plasma. And you can really see that you have this huge um, effect over here at wide angles. So this is in this equilateral um, regime. And so you can think of this as adding some kind of new um, interaction. And so it's really modifying the structure of the interaction of the quark gluon plasma. And you can really um, resolve kind of the shape of that um, modification. Sorry, these and are so all the, question, question, sorry. Yeah. These are, all, these are all theory calculations where you somehow set up a region of quark gluon plasma in some model yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So these oh, are these are so simulations. The model has the kinematics that you expect. Yes. Um, so okay. these, so it, it is being measured and will hopefully um, be out soon. But so this is really um, uh, currently this is showing that you can pick up the features of that simulation um, using these correlation functions. Um, and so then it will test if these simulations actually um, have anything to do with reality. Um, and so these are very complicated systems, which is why you actually want to kind of measure these things to try and extract something. So th these are actually simulations of actual uh, heavy ion collisions. Yes, yes. So they have the full, like, um, they are a simulation of the full um, thing, um, not just this toy setup, um, but they're definitely lacking in aspects of that simulation. Um, okay. Thanks. Um, and then so just to kind of um, all conclude with just kind of this, so obviously what you want to do is, um, as I described earlier, you want to go through as a function of the size and you can take the ratio of the vacuum to the uh, heavy ion. And as you move um, through towards this regime where you expect to be modified, you expect to see some um, deviation as you encounter the scale of this plasma. So this is just showing as you start going through, initially you see um, nothing. And then as you start to enter this region, enter the plasma, you see this huge enhancement um, here in the ratio. And so you can really kind of image as a function of scale, how things are being uh, modified as you kind of go back um, in time. And so this is why kind of having the perturbative understanding then allows you to go into these more complicated systems and kind of interpret what is um, being modified. Um, um, and so sorry for going over time. Uh, but just to conclude, so hopefully I convinced you that some of these insights from formal theory 
in particular about kind of how to phrase these questions are actually having an impact in uh, real world um, collider physics. And so this is largely due to this um, kind of operator product expansion limit um, where we can really study these uh, detectors in a kind of universal regime, which also applies in these more complicated collisions. Um, and hopefully this will allow us to understand um, these more complicated situations like heavy ion collisions um, or um, um, the production of top quarks or other um, more complicated systems. Um, and so thank you and sorry for going over time. More questions? So just uh, from the point of view of toy models, so yeah, you mentioned yeah. planar energy before. Is there any more complicated toy model you can do before actual, the actual QCD? Is there any intermediate? Uh... Yeah, so I think this, so one thing which would be very nice to have is which part of the problem that makes it very difficult is that you need something in at least three dimensions or above. Otherwise you don't have like a transverse structure to the jet. Um, and in that case, there's very few or actually none like exactly solved uh, models. And so what would be nicest is if to have some model where you actually have um, confinement to be able to see this. Um, and this is what's very hard to, or confinement plus um, string breaking. So you really have this um, asymptotically free region and then um, some confinement region. And so uh, I don't know of any better example than N equals four. So one thing that's also being tried from the more CFT side is you can try and do this in the icing model um, using data from the conformal bootstrap for the anomalous dimensions. Um, and then this operator product expansion. Um, and so that's whether or not one views that as a simpler model. Um, it's not good for perturbation theory, but um, for the two point function, one can study it there. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a big, so on the perturbative side, N equals four really helps, but for understanding um, like this transition, there's no like model right now where one can really compute something that turns over like this. Um, so does the supersymmetry help a priori or not? It's just n equals four is special, therefore it was good, but just doing some n equals one super young males or something like that, it's not obvious. Really. Yeah, n equals, so like in, in our first paper with Lance, we did like n equals one, and this doesn't help. The only thing that helps is to get the simplest expression possible for the integrand um, and that just and but there's no deep like um, there, there's it's much less understood how like symmetries like how let's say like dual conformal invariance or any of these things manifest in these physical observables and so like one concrete is and the reason why for example Korchemsky and stuff and Sokachev have studied the case of n equals four is it allows you to reduce um, the stress tensor to um, scalar operators. And so that just allows you to study um, them without indices. And that just makes it um, much simpler. Um, and so that's where the supersymmetry helps, um, particularly for the two point correlation function in N equals four. Because there you, you need like the TTTT and where two of these become detectors, but you can just reduce it to like the, the scalar, four point function of the scalar operator, which are much simpler. Um, Um, and so that's the that's where supersymmetry is helping there. Um, but yeah, but here one just wants the simplest expression for squared amplitudes. Um, can I ask a uh, question? This might be this is pretty off topic. Maybe this is I don't know if this is a good question or not. But one of the things that strikes me about this is that uh, it is. The, these are IR safe observables at the amplitude level, right? Well, and, yes or no? They're not the because so it depends how you can. It, they're really a squared. They're a squared amplitude because they're an expectation value. So you can either compute them 
like so if you really compute them with amplitudes you square the amplitude and then integrate it over the phase space yeah. um i guess i guess what i'm thinking is that yeah okay i understand what you're saying but i guess the point yeah. that, what i'm thinking is that they are a lot more they're correlation functions so you're right yeah they're yeah not, yes yeah yeah they're, 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 yeah so maybe they're like forward correlation so anyway what i was what i was wondering about is that uh i mean something that 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 another thing that people are are, are interested in is how to do calculations at uh, muon colliders where you are interested you have large uh you have large logs you have radiation effects all these things are large on the other hand uh you're interested in ir non-safe observables because you have you know the theory is completely perturbative and you can obviously yeah. calculate the amplitude for any number of w's or something like that yeah uh, yeah, 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 that's yeah. Not, yeah yeah and so i'm wondering does this stuff somehow help with that because it does give you a new class of ir safe observables and somehow because my, my understanding yeah. is that still that's there's a lot of things that are still not understood how to do the calculations for these ir yeah. safe observables. Yes. So I think it's an interesting, so the way that, or the, sorry, I'm scrolling. Uh, the, the regime where this really helps is when you have a, like a large multiplicity um, um, of, of final states. Um, but it, it, it could be interesting in that case in understanding the kind of transition region between where you want to think of like many W's and, and um, just a few W's. Because if you really have just like, Two or three, you should just compute the exclusive amplitude. Um, whereas if you have like many, many of them being, being produced well above the electroweak scale, um, then you really need to actually, as you say, worry about um, infrared and collinear safety. Um, and so, kind of related to your question, like one place where you can actually compute this transition is if you just Higgs the theory. Um, and so then you have this kind of transition at the um, scale of electroweak symmetry breaking. Um, and as you say, in that case, there's all these issues with like electroweak logs, which are not as well understood. Um, and that could definitely like one thing one can consider in some of these cases, you consider like detectors that only measure like W's or Z's. Um, and these will have, unlike, so if you measure everything, the stress tensor is conserved. And so it doesn't have an anomalous dimension. So these detectors have their own um, anomalous dimension if you restrict to certain states. And so this, that's yeah. That that could be an interesting way of, of thinking about some of those um, questions. Um, that one could kind of measure more exclusive objects um, like this, or detectors which detect, for example, just Ws or Zs, and then see what happens when one goes well above the electroweak scale. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Okay. Just uh, one more question about this IR safe. Uh... So there yeah. are some uh, definitions or attempts to define the S matrix, which is IR safe using these yes. idea of foolish state, this cloud. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you reinterpret that in this language of the detectors? Does, uh, or is there any relation a priori? Yes, that's a very good question. And so this is something we're thinking about in general is just how to understand in particular, well, amplitudes, but also these, for example, like soft charges in this language. Um, and so the belief is that, like, let's say you have some, and th this will be very um, sketchy, um, but that if you have those, like, pretty foolish, like, charges or something that are generated, so you have some charge that allows you to, for example, add some soft gluons or, like, dress your state. Um, that these will commute with the energy flow operator. It's and so this will mean that these these observables will be insensitive to adding that dressing, um, and that's what kind of makes them IR safe. Whereas if you have like a like a number operator or something that this will not have a, like a non-zero commutation relation that says it really like changes the the state as you add these in. Um, but one thing that yeah that we're trying to have is a is a better understanding of how like for example all these asymptotic symmetries and um it kind of fits into this picture um and it's not I don't have a complete picture yet but I think it would it would be nice to kind of talk about all these things in one um, consistent language um 
But the, the kind of short answer is that those dressings will not affect, that you can add these dressings. In this case, because it's infrared safe, you can add those dressings and it won't change the answer. Um, 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 does that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then one would like to um, go back to like interpret some of the amplitude questions in this light ray language. And then the amplitudes or the light rays that will appear in that case will have non trivial commutation relations. And one should be able to get, for example, like some of the soft theorems from just these commutation relations of these light rays. Um, um, but the, the kind of details are not quite, but I think one, one, I think there's a kind of coherent picture of these things, which would be nice to um, fully work out. Um, All right, any other questions, comments? Okay, well, let's thank Ian. Yes. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, yeah.